Hey, listeners, before we get started, an update on a couple stories. The first relates to teens Tate Meir, Madison Baldwin, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling. The four were killed and seven others were injured in the Oxford High School shooting last year. This week, their classmate, now 16-year-old Ethan Crumbly, pleaded guilty for first-degree murder, terrorism, and assault charges in the shooting. He faces up to life in prison. The involuntary manslaughter case against his parents is still underway, however. And their son said during his plea hearing that the gun he used from home was not secured, counter to what his parents, James and Jennifer Crumbly, have argued. In other news, three more men have been found guilty in connection to a 2020 plot to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Fourteen men had been charged overall. Two others were already acquitted at the federal level. Four were found guilty by a jury or plea and five others still have cases pending at the state level. For more on that and the Oxford cases, too, check out Freep.com and our daily voice briefings, also available on podcast apps. Now, here's today's episode. I hope that people in our state realize that we have a long way to go to protect reproductive freedom. You hear the honks. Planned Parenthood is not welcome here. This summer, when the U.S. Supreme Court overturned its ruling on Roe v. Wade, it threw the question of access to abortions back to the states. And now, that question is on your November ballot. You can't make us procreate. Politicians, advocates, religious groups, everyday people are in an all-out battle to get you to vote yes or no on a proposal that would enshrine the right to abortion in the state constitution. It's bleeding into every aspect of this election. The debate for governor. When Roe fell, Mrs. Dixon celebrated that. She said it didn't even go far enough. So when she calls me extreme, the truth is that there's no more extreme position than Governor Whitmer's on abortion. But what does Prop 3 actually say and do? What does it mean with an already existing, but temporarily blocked, 1931 state law on the books that criminalizes all abortions except to save the life of a mother? On this episode, we speak with Free Press reporter and Report for America fellow Clara Hendrickson. It's a whole host of services beyond just abortion. It's it's a right to reproductive freedom. We also talked to Free Press political reporter Dave Boucher. Supporters will tell you that it just simply enshrines protections that were provided under Roe. Critics will tell you is that it opens this door to this slippery slope. We break down the realities of Proposal 3 and the fight over abortion rights in Michigan. I'm Carrie Jr. II, and this is On the Line. Dave, can you like briefly tell us where we currently stand with abortion in Michigan? Yeah. So right now, today, abortion remains legal and accessible in Michigan, and that's due to a flurry of court activities, uh, chiefly a lawsuit brought by Governor Gretchen Whitmer before uh, the Dobbs ruling that overturned Roe. She used this as a vessel to prevent prosecutors in the 13 Michigan counties that have abortion clinics from filing charges against an abortion provider under that 1931 law that became relevant following Roe's reversal. That lawsuit's ongoing, but a judge's ruling is keeping abortions accessible until the legal matters are resolved. What is the exact language on the ballot? It's pretty long. So what the amendment is proposing is adding about 300 words to the Michigan Constitution. Uh, We have a copy of the amendment text on the Free Press website. You can read the full text of the amendment there. But essentially, it establishes a fundamental right to reproductive freedom, which it defines as entailing the right to make and effectuate decisions about all matters relating to pregnancy. So that includes abortion. It also includes contraception, um, miscarriage management, and prenatal care. So it's it's a whole host of services beyond just abortion. It's, it's a right to reproductive freedom. Can you give us a quick breakdown of like what happens there and how they decide how to, to word these proposals? So what voters are going to see on the ballot this fall is a ballot summary 
of uh, what the amendment proposes. It's not the actual words that would be inserted into the Michigan Constitution if this proposal is adopted. And that summary of the amendment is something that gets approved by a, a panel of folks who serve on the Board of State canvassers. They have to make sure the summary is true and impartial. But before the proposal even landed on the ballot, a legal fight took place about the actual text and format of the amendment. There were all sorts of questions about the actual words, whether or not there was enough space in between those words, whether or not the spacing constituted typos that would create substantial constitutional problems in the state moving forward. Ultimately, all of those were resolved by the court. And now this proposed amendment is going to voters on the ballot. And so just to be clear and and clarify, what does the amendment mean in terms of specifics? Like, does it mean approving abortion in all cases, in all trimesters, et cetera? So the amendment has the uh, ability for lawmakers to regulate abortions later in pregnancies. It defines that as after fetal viability, um, which would be in the judgment of a healthcare professional and the facts of, you know, the, the case in a pregnancy. And so that would be when it's determined that a fetus could likely survive outside of the uterus. And it the amendment, as it's written, would allow um, efforts to regulate abortion later in pregnancy, so long as the pregnant person still has the ability to get an abortion after viability if it's medically necessary to preserve their mental or physical health. And that would be left up to the, the judgment of the, the person who's providing care. So what does it mean exactly? What, what does it mean to vote yes or no on Proposition 3? So supporters will tell you that it just simply enshrines protections that were provided under Roe. Critics will tell you is that it opens this door to this slippery slope of all sorts of potentially unintended consequences. And they'll argue that the amendment undoes any number, dozens of laws that are already on the books. To be clear, there is nothing in this constitutional amendment that automatically makes any law on the books unconstitutional. That includes the 1931 law that that criminalizes many abortions. Now, the amendment could lead to those laws being deemed unconstitutional, but somebody would have to challenge any existing law under the confines of the new constitutional amendment that applies to laws like parental consent. There's currently a law in the books that requires parental consent in order for somebody to a minor to get an abortion. Ultimately, a lot of these questions are going to be decided in a court down the road. I see. So to clarify, if if hypothetically Proposal 3 passes, it doesn't mean that the fight is over completely. It just opens up another conversation for if people want to challenge that law. Yeah. I mean, just for context, you know, the second the, the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guarantees the right to bear arms. Right. And we are still litigating hundreds of years later what that actually means. So, no, that we're going to even if this is added to the state constitution, people will be fighting in theory, forever about what that means and how and whether people, lawmakers, can regulate that right to an abortion. I think it's also important to note that it creates rights that aren't just limited to abortion. It creates this fundamental right to reproductive freedom. So that includes access to contraception, for instance. I see. And so if it doesn't pass, uh, what's the situation there? So if it doesn't pass... Uh, There are a couple of scenarios that could play out. There are still the ongoing lawsuits over the legality of the 1931 law criminalizing most abortions. And a court could determine that even if this amendment isn't in the Constitution, the Michigan Constitution today uh, requires maintaining legal access to abortion in the state of Michigan. That, of course, is exactly what Whitmer's trying to do with her lawsuit. If they decide that the 1931 law criminalizing abortion is constitutional, then that means that most abortions in the state of Michigan are going to be criminalized. And it would be up to the local prosecutors to pursue uh, action in, in those instances. Is this the end of the line for supporters if they fail? Like, Would they try a ballot measure again? It's unlikely that somebody would, would launch that expensive endeavor if Michigan voters reject it. Like to, to try it again after two years is, is potentially a recipe for, for failure. It, it's potentially more likely if that vote fails, there's 
clearly an avenue just through the legislature to change that 1931 law and to pass a law that says that there is some sort of access to abortion. If Governor Whitmer wins and if Democrats take control of one or both chambers of the legislature, then in, that's probably something we're going to see. Obviously, I know there are a lot of ifs there. And in a scenario where this amendment fails, it's unlikely that Democrats will take control of both chambers and potentially unlikely that the governor wins. Michigan's top three officials, all Democratic incumbents up for re-election, have been leading in polls over their Republican challengers in recent months. However, that gap narrowed by multiple points for all three, according to an October poll conducted for the Free Press and its media partners. And while Michigan Dems have their best shot in decades at taking the Michigan Senate, that's highly contested, too. After the break, how voters seem to be leaning on the issue, what's real in the rhetoric, and how abortion is impacting other races. And we're back with Free Press reporters Dave Boucher and Claire Hendrickson talking about Proposal 3 on the November 8th ballot. So to Clara, what are we hearing about polling on laws surrounding Proposal 3? Sure. So the Free Press commissioned a poll that was conducted in late September, and it found significant support for Proposal 3. 64 percent of voters surveyed said that they plan to vote yes on Proposal 3. That includes 88 percent of Democratic voters, 64 percent of independents, and 40 percent of Republican voters. Not a majority, a plurality of Republican voters plan to vote against Proposal 3, but it's still pretty significant support among Republicans. And the poll that we commissioned found that uh, a candidate's position on Proposal 3 and whether or not it accords with the own the, the voters' preference on, on that amendment, um, it's impacting how, how voters are seeing candidates and are weighing in on those campaigns. Is there any indication yet on who's all going to come out to vote? That's a, a question mark. Mm-hmm. We are getting some initial absentee ballot request and ballot return data in that indicates that we could potentially be on track for a very high turnout for a midterm election. You have to sign petitions in order to get an amendment, proposed amendment on a ballot. And this amendment had more than 700,000 signatures. It was the highest number of signatures ever submitted for any ballot measure in Michigan. Around 425,000 were needed to get on the ballot. So the 700,000 signatures can be seen as indicative of a a potentially high level of support. Of course, there are going to be probably people who sign it and vote against it. But but by and large, I think that that's indicative that people are very interested in the issue. And it's it's hand in hand with the governor's race, the race for attorney general and other races. And so if you're going to go vote in one of those races, chances are you're probably going to go vote for uh, Amendment 3 as well. Now, campaign financials can also tell us a lot about support and advocacy efforts, too. The news filings in three months are due October 28th. So make sure to check Freep.com for more on that. I see. And and so to that point, like, and you touched on it earlier, Claire, like how is this bleeding into the other races? How is this interesting in terms of how, how it relates to Tudor Dixon and her placement in this race? Yeah. So it was really fascinating to watch her speech uh, at the Trump rally in Macomb County the other week, where she basically said that. Democrats have tried to make the governor's race about abortion and my opposition to abortion rights, but abortion is on the ballot. Voters are going to decide the issue and abortion's really not an, you know, not at play in the governor's race. So she's kind of trying to create some distance between her views on abortion rights um, and sort of the dynamics of the, the governor's race. Even if voters adopt Proposal 3, though, there's still legislation that lawmakers are likely to pursue regulating abortions. And that legislation would come before uh, Tudor Dixon if she is elected. Mm, Interesting strategy there. Um, Dave, what do critics and opponents say about the ballot item? Yeah, so so critics among among them, uh, Tudor Dixon and others, typically Republicans and, and generally conservatives, have argued that the amendment goes far beyond just codifying Roe. Opponents argue, again, that this amendment is going to not only allow abortions at any time, and they're, and they're talking about this idea of up until like the minute before the person who's pregnant gives birth. They're also talking about the idea that it could do away with parental consent laws and that it opens the doors to any number of procedures related to gender assignment and to sterilization. The word sterilization is in the amendment or all these other issues, specifically cultural issues, you can argue, that have kind of permeated 
any number of topics that come up on on the campaign trail for Republicans. Is is that in the amendment? Is that what it would do? So supporters of the the amendment will say that no, that there is fear mongering that's going on here, right? And that so, for example, um, there's this idea that you hear that it opens the door to a so called late term abortion, and so supporters of of abortion rights will say that term is a little bit misleading. Let's say that that the person who's pregnant is is eight months along. And then they find out that their their fetus is not viable. A critic would argue that that is a late term abortion, but that a medical provider will tell you that that fetus has no chance of of being able to live. Again, I think it's important to note that it it is difficult to predict with 100 percent accuracy exactly how the amendment will be applied before we see how courts rule and before we see what exact language is introduced. So on the issue of abortions later in pregnancy, this has really been a key focus of opponents to the measure. And I think it's important just to put some numbers in context here. Last year in Michigan, nearly 90 percent of abortions occurred in the first trimester, and that's according to state health department data. Uh, If you look at the CDC data from 2019, it was fewer than 1 percent were performed uh, after 21 weeks in the pregnancy. So the amendment prohibits banning any abortions after fetal viability that are deemed medically necessary it largely leaves those decisions and determinations up to the health care professional that's providing care. Um, but it's the case with any amendment that there could be some interpretation over these matters um, and how they get decided in particular cases. Can you clarify what this proposal is saying about the issue of sterilization and you know gender identity? The actual language of the amendment says a fundamental right to reproductive freedom including but not limited to prenatal care, childbirth, postpartum care, contraception, sterilization, abortion care, miscarriage management, and infertility care. Now, again, that's those terms are in there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there will be an unfettered right to sterilization for minors. You know what I mean? Ultimately, a lot of what's going to the actual practical implications of this will be decided either through legislation that comes out if and when this amendment is adopted, or through court rulings that come out if and when this language that's adopted is challenged. Got it. So not necessarily straightforward. But this is, and just to to hammer this home, every single time something is added to the state or U.S. Constitution, it is challenged repeatedly in court. Like that is, that is just how this works. And different interpretations over time lead to different ways that constitutional language is, is applied. And so that it is it is very difficult for uh, opponents to say with any level of certainty that any of that those uh, potential fears are going to actually play out. And we talked about this affecting races in general, the governor's race. Is this affecting other races? Well, it's interesting because even offices that have nothing to do with abortion, like the secretary of state's office, we've been seeing abortion uh, in both, or I guess, pretty much exclusively Republican candidate Christina Caramo, her views in opposition to abortion rights being highlighted in attack ads against her. She's talked about her views on abortion in her podcast. She's said that it's, you know, one of the one of the issues that's influenced her decision to run. But the secretary of state's office really doesn't have any say in the provision of uh, abortion rights or any efforts to regulate abortion in the state of Michigan. But I think it's an indication that this is such um, such a key issue that is top of mind for voters this fall. So anyone is trying to seize on that momentum, even in races that don't have anything to do with it. Yeah. And in the very quickly in the race for attorney general, uh, Michigan Republican attorney general nominee Matt Perno has said that he doesn't favor any exemptions. So, you know, he, he supports a complete ban on abortion. And there's also audio that was released in late September of him saying that he would potentially like to ban contraception, specifically Plan B. Uh, it, the audio seems to indicate that he doesn't know what Plan B is. And then when it is explained to him, he says, yes, you've got to figure out how to ban the pill from the state. You have to stop it at the border. We heard from the White House press secretary uh, lambast those uh, those comments. So this is permeating many races, as Clara said, whether or not they have like a direct impact on reproductive rights in those official capacities. Before we wrap up, this is one of several proposals. Um, Really briefly, Clara, what are the others? 
So there's proposal one, which would change term limits for state lawmakers, and it would also require financial disclosures by some statewide offices and state legislators. There's also proposal two, which would change voting rules and election law in the state of Michigan. It It's a wide-ranging proposal, uh, but one of the key changes is establishing uh, early voting in the state of Michigan and codifying current voter ID rules to preempt any efforts to make those more stringent in the future. So how can people get their vote counted at this point? Voting is underway in Michigan. Folks can request an absentee ballot um, online or by mail. They can go to their local clerk's office or satellite clerk's office to vote um, in person, fill out their absentee ballot right then and there and return it. Folks have until 8 p.m., November 8, to return those absentee ballots. You can also register if you're not registered to vote before or on Election Day. And you can also vote in person. Uh, Polls open at 7 a.m. and close at 8 p.m. Yeah. While there is, of course, still time to request an absentee ballot via mail and to, in theory, return it via mail, the the chances of your your vote being counted go up drastically if you take that absentee ballot and just take it into your clerk's office. Any ballot that is received after 8 p.m. on Election Day doesn't count. And obviously polls will be open for a long time on Election Day and there's plenty of time to go down and, and cast your ballot in person. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Clara. Thanks so much. I hope that was helpful. Uh, very helpful. Be sure to check out our voter guide on Freep.com to learn more about the candidates and proposals on the ballot. Audio from the gubernatorial debates comes courtesy of Wood TV 8 and WXYZ Scripts. This episode was produced by me, Darcy Moran, and Robin Chan. Angela Delgado and Marianne Struman are our executive producers. Peter Batia is our editor. The music for the show is called Fort Trumbull and was produced by DJ Lost Boy. Thanks as always for listening. Don't forget to like, share the show, and don't forget to come back next week for more. See you then.